was really thanking Laura for putting this tremendous program together and all the lead up to the program because um, I'm particularly proud of Laura for doing this because as many of you know, Adina Abelis, our education and training uh, director is on maternity leave and Laura arrived um, only a little while before Adina went on maternity leave. So she really um, developed this program and put it together largely by herself. So it's a big feat to have that done and really appreciate it. One thing that Laura didn't mention is that she's developed a, an innovation um, for this program, which we're going to prototype here in the spirit of the D School at Stanford, where you need find and you iterate and you prototype and you iterate some more. And that is that after each of our panelists, we're going to delve into about a two minute um, a period where you confer with each other about what you just heard and reflect a little bit um, so that you can kind of further develop your thoughts. And it might be two minutes or more. But we'll see how it goes. And this is all in service to a really rich discussion that will happen not only among the panelists, hopefully I'll be able to help with that a teeny bit, but then um, between and among all of us uh, after the panelists have each presented and talked a bit among themselves. So this is an opportunity for you to really um, kind of fortify your thoughts a little bit and, um, and confer with your colleagues and test some ideas and think about um, the kinds of questions that you want to be asking the panelists. So thanks, Laura, for that innovation. I think it will be a lot of fun to try it. Pretty soon she'll have us like tweeting and <laughs> pushing buttons and all sorts of things. But you know, for now, we're just going to talk with each other between the panelists. OK, so um, what I get to do is just briefly introduce each of our panelists. They have really lovely bios. I suspect that each of you have had the opportunity to look at each of their bios. Um, our three panelists are um, Jen Kimberly, uh, Graham Forbes, and Alan Lovewell. And Jen and Graham work together, if you haven't figured that out yet, um, at one of the Center for Ocean Solutions collaborating institutions, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And Jen has a long history with the Seafood Watch program at the aquarium, having been there kind of on the ground floor, leaving for a while, and then coming back. Um, to, to actually reconfigure the program and see it through its next evolution. And it really has evolved, evolved a, a lot, excuse me. <clears throat> and I know that you're going to get a taste of that uh, through tonight's discussion uh, because the whole idea behind really changing the seafood market um, from something that looked quite unsustainable into something that looked more sustainable started by reaching out to the consumer directly. And um, we really evolved in this process and thinking about what will be the most effective means to, to change behavior, not only on the individual level, but on the market level, on the sort of human institutions level. And that's what today is all about, understanding the theory and practice of changing human behavior towards greater sustainability. And so Laura's put together this panel that's focused on seafood, um, but I think a lot of what we're going to be talking <coughs> tonight would be transferable to other domains. So try to keep staying in touch with the idea of the transferability of what you're hearing and thinking about this evening um, into other domains, and I think that will us quite far. So, first speaker, Jen. So, she does direct the Seafood Watch program at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, she's done a lot of work with fishermen in the past, uh, working with fishermen's associations, working at Oceana, advocacy side, um, and working kind of in the academic um, terrain as well, thinking about fisheries and sustainability from an environmental sciences standpoint. Each of our panelists has a master's degree, just so you know kind of where they are. Some of them from quite local institutions, like Grand, who is our next speaker. UC Santa Cruz. UC and San Diego and San Diego State. Oh, so damn. California local. I got yeah. it wrong. I think it's <laughs> Alan Lovewell. Yes, who's from. 
Monterey Institute for International Studies. Oh, okay. So you know, I stood up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Should have made this more of a Q&A, but anyway. <laughs> Grant works with Jen, um, if you haven't figured that out already. And he's part of this evolution of the CD Watch program, where they've really pivoted and started looking at um, the vendor relationships and the buyers, the major buyers. So he's engaging with these really um, large scale uh, forces in the market and helping Seafood Watch leverage this opportunity through these huge buyers, and um, so we'll learn more about um, how we investigate and understand the market and what the power of addressing the market at these key leverage points looks like. Um, one fun fact about Graham is that when he and I first met, he's like, I know you, you were on the California Coastal Commission. I used to do local land use stuff on coastal um, in coastal regions, so he has a rich and diverse past um, that includes coastal land use, if um, yep. folks want to talk about that with Graham. And um, he's got a strong background in the social sciences, political science and sociology. So the literature that you read going into this evening, um, he was quoting from it at dinner tonight. So I just want you to know he's <laughs> ready to answer the tough questions. About the theory. Because <laughs> 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 I certainly am not, no, just kidding. All right, so Alan Lovell, our last um, um, uh, panelist, uh, was recently a contestant in Fish 2.0. So, any of you who want to find out about some of the really innovative stuff that's going on um, with sustainable fisheries um, and how young entrepreneurs like Alan are pitching themselves to venture capitalists um, and other financial investors. Um, he has good stories to tell about that. Um, he was born and raised on the East Coast, has a lot of experience with New England fisheries management, but also abroad in Indonesia um, and working with the Nature Conservancy and Conservation International. And um, Alan founded this local business that has been underway for about three years, now has over 400 customers um, called Local Catch Monterey Bay. And how many of you know about Local Catch Monterey Bay? Yes. <laughs> oh, look at this. If they are not friends, <laughs> they will be. That's great. <laughs> exactly. I was going to lock the door. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave it. Um, so That's their business plan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Initial job, I think, is, is just about done. Each of our panelists has uh, prepared a short um, kind of presentation to serve up um, the different elements of how they think about adjusting um, human behavior and market behavior. And, um, and then after each of them, again, the two or so minutes where you get to jabber among ourselves, and then we'll come together as a panel, we'll ask a few more questions, but then really opening it up to all of you so that we can have this really rich discussion. So Jen, you get to kick us off. Sure. We're going to test my technological savvy. Right, Laura? <laughs> so I'm hoping it's right. There we go. OK, that was painless. Thanks for being here tonight. I know on a Friday night, month of December, maybe not where you want to be right now, but we're going to keep this engaged and we're going to talk to you about how Seafood Watch started and where it is today because it's really been an amazing journey over the past 12 or so years. Like Meg said, I've been with the program since the beginning. The Seafood Watch concept actually launched in 1997, 1998 with an exhibit called Fishing for Solutions. Does anyone recall that exhibit? Yeah, so it talked about the issues threatening marine life, especially as it relates to fishing activities, but it also put a positive spin on it. What are fisheries doing to improve or modify their gear to minimize their impact? So to complement or accent that exhibit, the aquarium started actually doing some pretty crude assessments of fisheries and aquaculture operations against a handful of criteria looking at, you know, like stock status, um, bycatch rates, habitat impacts from particular gear. And they put a little list out on the tables in the restaurant at the time. And they were meant to be table cards that stayed there. And people started taking them. And that's exactly how the Seafood Watch program was born. At the same time, 
Carl Safina published in Audubon magazine a list of seafood. Who remembers that centerfold? It was one of the first big lists that got out mainly on the East Coast, but it did trickle nationwide. So the nice thing is you had a movement on the East Coast, a movement on the West Coast, and we we're trying to coordinate, and a movement was truly born. And when we started, the movement was very, very consumer focused. It was just making people aware that you can start sourcing your seafood from more environmentally responsible fisheries and fish farms. We thought it would take 10 years at the time, at least for businesses to engage. And the real focus around engaging the consumer was to get them to not source or buy anything from that red list or the avoid list. Okay? When I show you our theory of change in a minute, you'll see how that has really changed. We are today a member of a group called the Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions. That is a group of 18 NGOs in North America who right now are engaged in working with businesses and consumers and advising them on more sustainable or environmentally responsible seafood sourcing. So it went from two organizations to 18 in this country and in Canada and this whole movement is global right now. There's a lot going on in almost every continent um, globally. And you know, our mission is really to engage and empower consumers and businesses to purchase environmentally responsible seafood. And I'm going to talk about what that means here in a minute. I'll actually define that for you. But this is our theory of change right now. And like I said, when we started the whole program you know, 12 years ago or more, it was about changing consumer behavior with the hopes that businesses would soon come up with some sort of purchasing policies to do the same thing, avoid what's on the red list. At the same time, the whole concept of eco-certified seafood was percolating and the Marine Stewardship Council was born and the MSC Eco-Label came out. And we always envisioned that Seafood Watch would just be that interim step. Our list of seafood recommendations would just be around long enough until enough fisheries were certified and consumers didn't even have to ask questions or use the pocket guide. They could just go into the store and look for the eco-label. But the reality is, how much of our seafood is imported? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, over 90%, right? Any guess on how many fisheries, let alone fish farms, these major companies and retailers actually source from? Thousands. So, the reality of the movement, the challenge that we had to face is the MSC, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, all these eco-label schemes, it's going to take a lot of time to get all of the sources of fisheries and farms assessed and eco-certified. And they actually have to, a lot of them, improve to that level to actually get eco-certified. So Seafood Watch, turns out, had a much longer life than we had ever anticipated. And unfortunately, probably a lot longer life. I, the way I like to talk about it is we, are, we will be successful when I'm out of a job, when enough seafood has been eco-certified that you can just walk into a store and it's good to go. That's going to take some more time. So here's our theory of change right now. We still want consumers to use tools like the pocket guide, and I'll show you some other tools in a minute here. We want there to be a buzz. We want there to be a visible demand. But the ask of consumers is no longer to avoid everything on the red list and only buy from the yellow and green list. It's more of just ask a question at point of sale. And by point of sale, I mean at a restaurant or a retailer. Go in and say, do you serve sustainable seafood? Is this sustainable? Do you have some sort of policy here? If you want to get a little deeper and start using the card, that's great. But what we really are after is having more consumers create a buzz. All right, so I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So we want this visible demand. We also want the consumers who want to dive a little bit deeper to hold some of these businesses accountable. So we do have a group of consumers that we call advocates. Those are the people who will go into a business and basically make more of a fuss and do a little watchdogging for us. All right? So businesses are starting to respond, and this actually really kicked off around 2006, 2007. We saw McDonald's, Walmart, and Compass Group. And Compass Group, by the way, is the largest contract food service company out there. And what I mean by contract food service, it's a company that will create the restaurant for, that is in Monterey Bay Aquarium, or at Yahoo, or Google's offices. They're the ones that provide the restaurant and the food for those employees. So they all created sustainable seafood commitments around about that time. The challenge was 
they made a lot of these things time bound. Like we're going to be all sustainable by 2012 or all sustainable by 2015. And those dates have either passed or are coming quickly. So that keeps us very, very busy to assess seafood so they know what sources to go toward and what to stay away from. Graham's going to talk a lot about those challenges. And Graham, are you going to talk about the motivations as well? A little bit. But you know, it was consumer demand, but the businesses also really want the reward. So even if they are doing the right thing, it's important that they know the consumers actually appreciate that. So that's another big ask of the consumers, and I'll show you a tool for that in a second. So when businesses do finally make a commitment, there are more options, more sustainable options available for consumers, and there's this just nice cycle of awareness. We also do a lot with the media with celebrity spokespersons, celebrity chefs. We just had 20 celebrity chefs in town this week just to educate them about seafood sustainability. Then they go back and when they're on Top Chef or when they're on the Food Network or when they're doing their cookbooks, they're making sure that all those ingredients are sustainable and they usually will drop some sort of plug. All right. So this is all about keeping the buzz, keeping the pressure on. So that's why in the circle there you see this sustainable seafood awareness. But underneath all of this, is our research. And if we didn't have trusted, credible Seafood Watch recommendations, the whole thing folds like a house of cards. I'll talk to you about that in a minute as well. So ultimately, when the businesses make their recommendations and their commitments to source from only environmentally responsible sources, that sends a very clear message down the supply chain that I'm not buying stuff on the red list or I'm only looking for eco-certified seafood. And what we're seeing now, today, over the past few years is the producers, what I mean by producers, the fishermen, the fisheries, the fish farmers, they're actually responding. They're either looking to get eco-certified, they're engaging in improvement projects, or they're looking to be rated by the Seafood Watch program. So that, to me, is some progress. And for something that we thought would take a lot longer, it actually started happening a lot quicker, which puts a lot of stress on our program, but it's a good problem to have. So I just want to talk to you about what we mean by our sustainable seafood recommendations or what we define as environmentally responsible. We have three categories for Seafood Watch recommendations. Seafood that we feel is the best choice, a yellow good alternative, or a red avoid. Yellow, there are some concerns. Green, we think it's OK. But green by no means means it's met the holy grail. Even things in the green category, and I'm getting into this level with you guys because I know you appreciate the granularity and the intricacies of marine science, doesn't mean things are perfect. Okay? But these are your best choices, your most environmentally responsible sources out there. Things on the red list, list have critical enough issues that we need to just lay off for now and send a very strong and clear market signal that improvements need to be made. Right? So we ask businesses to source from these two lists. We also ask businesses to source from what we define as credible eco-certification programs, like the Marine Stewardship Council. And there are a handful of others out there. They're all um, identified on our website. And we did a benchmarking study to compare the credibility and equivalency of these programs against our criteria. I'd be happy to talk to you more about that in depth on the side, just for sake of time. And we're also recognizing fisheries and aquaculture programs that are improvement projects. And these are anything from, if you've got a bycatch issue, you have a gear modification that you're trying out, you're trying to improve to a level that you could get eco-certified. So in the past, 10 years ago, we would have said, avoid the red snapper fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. But now, behind the scenes, we were talking to businesses saying, keep sourcing from that fishery but tell them you're only going to source from that fishery or buy from that fishery if it continues to make progress. And what happened in the red snapper fishery is that it did make progress, and now it's a seafood watch yellow. It actually came out of the red. So this is more of a business-to-business -business conversation. Again, we'd be happy to talk about that model as well. So in essence, seafood recommendations are not just the seafood watch yellow and green list. And a lot of these conversations, as you can see, start to get more complicated. So they're not conversations that we have with the consumer. They're conversations we have with the business. So what you'll see on the consumer tools, like the pocket guide, are very general rules of thumb, questions you can ask at the point of sale to keep the buzz going, keep the businesses at the table, keep them held accountable. But the real focused, really detailed conversations are behind the scenes, business to business, and Graham will be talking about that. 
the Seafood Watch recommendations are actually supporting the work of a lot of those NGOs who are part of that Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions. All right, so groups like Fish Choice, FishWise actually advises Target and Safeway on their seafood purchasing. They use the Seafood Watch recommendations. Shed Aquarium in Chicago advises companies in their backyard using the Seafood Watch recommendations. This is our attempt as a movement to harmonize so we don't have discrepancies and one group saying one thing and another group saying another thing. That was our huge Achilles heel over the past 10 or so years where the critics, the seafood industry, anyone who just kind of questioned what we were doing were able to say, how come you're saying this but Blue Ocean Institute's saying that? So we needed to get rid of that Achilles heel, and we needed to minimize that confusion. So we came together as a movement, and now we're using pretty much the similar methodology, and that is that of Monterey Bay Aquarium. Graham will also talk to you how collectively this means over 1,000 businesses are using the Seafood Watch recommendations, and if you extrapolate that out, that's over 100,000 locations across North America. And we also have 100 organizations, zoos, aquariums, Georgia Aquarium, Seattle Aquarium, Lynn Blatt Expeditions doing eco uh, cruises. They're all helping us spread the word about sustainable seafood. So I'm just briefly going to go over the types of tools that we have so you can see um, how they go from very basic to much more complicated depending on who you are. So we do a lot of work with chefs and the media and reach out to the consumer group through social media. And this is, again, very basic messaging. Avoid farm salmon. Um, what's another basic one? Does anyone know? Anyone? A seafood Watch recommendation? Come on. What about wild salmon from Alaska? Is that something you should buy? Yeah. So very, very general. Now, if I was talking to someone who was really buying Alaska seafood, specifically salmon, it would be a much different conversation if I was talking to Walmart. We would actually get down to the fishery level and talk about, well, you know, that run of salmon is actually, that fishery is actually kind of taking some endangered fish from BC, so you might want to avoid the Southeast Alaska fishery. This one's a bit more sustainable. The conversation's a very, very different B2B. But for this group, very basic, very engaging. The consumer is the same thing. Those pocket guides, general rule of thumb. We even have language on there that says, this is only a snapshot of our recommendations. It's only about 70 of them. Please go to our app or website for more information. Nobody reads that. So we continue to get the criticism that, you know, what do you do when a consumer walks in to Whole Foods with this card, but Whole Foods is using our database of 2,500 more detailed recommendations? How do you rectify that? And that's through education of the staff at point of sale at those companies so they can actually have a conversation and say, we understand you have the pocket guide. I got that. That is only a snapshot of their recommendations. If you go to their app or website, you will see that this is actually an environmentally responsible choice. That took me two seconds to say, but it takes a lot of training to get the staff to actually carry that message forward. I talked earlier when I put up that infographic about the uh, theory of change, how important it is for consumers to ask questions but also to reward the businesses. FishMap is one of the ways that we do that. Every time a consumer goes into a business, be it a restaurant or a retailer, and they have sustainable options on their menu or they have some sort of sustainable sourcing policy, we want them to mark it on FishMap. We also recognize these businesses on our website, and of course we just talk them up in media, talk about them with the celebrity chefs, and just continually get that buzz out there about what companies are starting to do the right thing. And just in case you want to drill down into any of the recommendations, all of the recommendations that we have are online. All of the assessments behind the recommendations are online. They're peer-reviewed reports. They take anywhere from six months to a year to create. It's a very robust process. And again, I, I'd be happy to talk about that in more detail later on. So when you are a business, you're not getting the basic language. You're getting the much deta more detailed look. These are two examples of software packages that we have for businesses that will query our full data set of Seafood Watch recommendations. So they'll enter, I'm getting beer battered cod from Iceland, FAO zone XYZ, and it will query the corresponding Seafood Watch recommendation. Okay. I talked briefly about the rigor of the program, and I think this is really important. We've got 18 staff, 30 contractors helping us assess these global fisheries and farms. We have an academic science advisory board. 
We run these fisheries and farms against our criteria. Like I said, it takes a long time, but we don't want to compromise quality because if we do, again, the credibility goes out the window and the businesses walk, and I wouldn't blame them. So a huge aspect of our program is on that scientific integrity. And these are just two tools you can go to find our reports, and at this website right here is where you can actually submit, comment, and upload any new information. So we're always tracking the latest and greatest and keeping these reports updated. We try not to let any report go beyond three years without updating it. And we will update something immediately if we learn about new information. We were talking about market squid over dinner and how things are changing there potentially. So how are we doing? We do rocket research to kind of, you know, see where we are. We know about 60% of consumers are aware of the concept of sustainable seafood. Remember, right now our theory of change is consumers, we just want a buzz out there, right? So businesses think that the consumers care and it holds their feet to the fire and they have some sort of sustainability commitment. We know that more than half a million consumers have adopted the Seafood Watch program. These are the ones who are a little more evangelical. They go into the business. They ask those needling questions. They're the ones that are maybe using Project Fish Map and saying, oh, I just went to Passion Fish. They have a sustainability initiative. I'm going to enter that into the database. We know that more than 4.5 million have actually trialed the program. That means they went in and they did ask some sort of questions at point of sale. Our goal is to get about 10 million people doing that. So you'll see more activity around social media to try to get to that audience. We do know that our biggest criticism from consumers is that information is too complex and it's disputed at point of sale. So we are trying to make the materials more simple for consumers, but by making the information more simple, what happens? The industry and governments criticize us for making the information too general. So it's a very delicate balance, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about that a little bit later on. The barrier of you know, someone at the point of sale, like a wait staff person or a chef or the seafood counter guy, that issue we're trying to overcome with really trying to get a diversity of businesses engaged and educated about our program and giving them our data. So Graham will talk to you a lot about how many of these top retailers and food service companies are engaged what the expectations are of their supply chain. But the good news is we are seeing a lot of fisheries and fish farms responding, seeking eco-certification, getting engaged in improvement projects. And that to us is progress, which in the big scheme of things is a really short period of time. 10 to 12 years is a short window for such a huge movement to have the impact that it is. So with that, how was I on time? <laughs> Okay, all right. I think and we're going to hand it over to Graham and he can talk a little bit more.